in the standard descriptions of the path. The Buddha defines goodwill as a type of right resolve, ill will as a type of wrong resolve. But there's an interesting passage where the Buddha says ill will is also a wrong view. The implication being that goodwill is a form of right view. The view with ill will, of course, is that you would gain something by seeing somebody else suffering. The right view is that you gain something by seeing everybody happy, wishing everybody to be happy. We live in this world where it's really difficult to know what to do sometimes. We deal with individuals, and as John Fung used to say, it's not like you're dealing with one person, you're dealing with five aggregates, and then when you have another person, it's like five more, although it's more like multiplying rather than adding. You've got 25 with just two people, and that goes up from there. And we'd like some good rules of thumb that would apply in all cases to give us some idea of what to do. And there are not that many. We have to use our discernment. But it's an important insight to realize that discernment has to be based on goodwill. That is a rule of thumb. When you're dealing with yourself, let's say it's when you're meditating, you want to meditate with goodwill, which doesn't mean being kind to yourself and giving yourself ice cream all the time. But it does mean that when you're being critical with yourself, it's for the purpose of improvement, not for the purpose of discouragement. When you're practicing goodwill for others, again, it doesn't mean you always say the nice, kind thing that they want to hear. But you always do want to have that person's best interests in mind. And if you make this a regular practice, as you leave meditation, think thoughts of goodwill to everybody. And John Sawan used to say, when you start with goodwill for everybody at the beginning of a meditation session, it's basically for you. To clear away the difficult issues of the day, no matter what other people have said to you or no matter what other people have done, you spread goodwill to them, you spread goodwill to yourself. You remind yourself that's why you're here. That gets the mind in the right frame to sit down and meditate and not get entangled with a lot of the, the loose ends from the events of the day. Then when you come out of meditation, he says, devote some time to goodwill again. And this time it's for the purpose of the others. Your mind has greater strength when you're coming out of concentration. And whatever you can think of that would be good for other people, may you wish it for them. And some people can actually pick it up. I've known of a couple of cases where people ask me, were you spreading thoughts of goodwill in my direction last night? It turned out that I was. And this is a universal thing with meditators, that your goodwill is stronger as you come out. But it's also, again, for the, the purpose of the others that you carry this out, and it's for your own well-being as well, that you carry this attitude of goodwill into the world from your meditation. Because after all, goodwill is to remind you that you don't want to do anything for the harm of other beings. On the one hand, you don't have that karma. And two, if things in a relationship go poorly, you don't have the self-recrimination that comes from realizing, well, you actually wished the other person ill at some point. It's a lot easier when the relationships end, that they end with goodwill. And of course, goodwill is what keeps the relationships going as long as they can. And remember what goodwill means. You wish that everybody would understand the causes for true happiness and be willing and able to act on them. That applies to you, applies to other beings. I knew this one woman one time who was having some difficulties with her landlord, and she told me she was trying to spread thoughts of goodwill in his direction, imagining him with a really nice house, a swimming pool, and lots of cars. And I said, wait a minute, stop, stop, stop. That's not what happiness is all about. 
you wish that that person would act in a skillful way. And you try to think, if you have to have involvement with that person, what would be the skillful thing to do and say, so that that person would also think about being skillful. Sometimes that's a tall order, it's a little bit too much. That's where you have to have equanimity. This is why the Brahma Viharas all go together. But you do want to maintain your goodwill in all situations. As the Buddha said, you want to protect your goodwill as a mother would protect her only child. Sometimes that image is misinterpreted as meaning that she would love everybody the same way a mother would love her only child, but that's impossible. The Buddha never asked for impossibilities. Never placed impossible goals on people. But your goodwill is something you can protect in the same way that a mother would protect her only child. As I say, she would protect her only child with her life. There are times when you have to be willing to put up with some losses as long as you maintain your goodwill. The image the Buddha gives is of a group of bandits pinning you down, and they're sawing off your limbs with two-handled saws. They've overpowered you. There's nothing you can do. He said, even in a case like that, you have to have goodwill for them. Now, the purpose of that image was to remind people that a lot of times the things that we get upset about are much less violent and much less detrimental than having our limbs sawed off. So this is a case where the Buddha is establishing a very high standard, but it is possible. When people say harsh things, when people do, people do violence to you, you still got to have goodwill for them. That's your protection. This is a theme that you hear over and over again in town. You don't hear it quite so much here in the West, that you really do protect yourself through your goodwill. On the one hand, you protect your state of mind. And there is a power to goodwill. Or people come at you with bad intentions. Sometimes they pick up the power of your goodwill, and it changes their intentions. There are lots of stories of this in the Thai tradition. Lots of stories in the in the canon. Devadatta had sent some men to kill the Buddha. Was, they're going to do it one at a time. In other words, one person was sent to kill the Buddha, and then as he was about to leave, there was another person who was sent to kill him, and there was another person sent to kill the second person, to erase the evidence. The first person comes in as he approaches the Buddha, and he's overwhelmed by the Buddha's goodwill. The Buddha gives him a little talk, and he says, no, don't go by that way that you were told to go. Go another way. And the second man, curious, why didn't the first man come? He comes in, sees the Buddha, and the Buddha spreads goodwill to him. That way he saves the lives of all these people. So think of goodwill as a power. Sometimes we think of Loving-kindness is kind of weak and namby-pamby. It's not. It's a power. This is the power that the, the Buddha depended on in order to gain awakening, to teach his teachings. After all, the Four Noble Truths, what are they but an expression of goodwill, taking everybody's suffering as the big issue and showing how, how we all can put an end to our suffering. It was goodwill that the Buddha depended on to teach and went out of his way. Ordinarily, a, a teaching Buddha has only one duty, which is to teach his contemporaries how to gain awakening. And then there's the optional duty of establishing a dharma and venia that will last a long time for future generations. It takes a lot more effort. But again, it was his goodwill for us that gave him the strength to establish the Dharma and Vinyan that we can benefit from up to now. So think of goodwill as a kind of power. It's also a kind of discernment. It's a wisdom. After all, it is right view and right resolve together. Your view that you would benefit if everybody could be happy, and your resolve to act on that view. So in difficult situations where you're not quite sure what to do, at least hold on to your goodwill. 
Sometimes it helps the situation come out fine. Sometimes, even if the situation doesn't come out fine, at least you come out fine. You come out fine because you have no self-recriminations, no areas where you can criticize yourself. And this doesn't mean you get entangled with other people. I know some people don't want to practice goodwill because they're afraid of entanglements. But think of that story of a John fooling with the snake in his room. His goodwill for the snake was basically, may you go someplace else where you live in peace. And the basic wish of goodwill, that other beings would learn how to be skillful. That's basically wishing that they would become independent. May they look after themselves with ease. Or the passage where the Buddha has monks spread goodwill to snakes, not so that the snakes will come around and hug the monks, but so the snakes will go away, leave the monks alone but with goodwill, realizing that we all have to go our separate ways at one point, so may we go wishing everybody well. And if we happen to meet up again, we've got a good past with each other. So having that good past with one another helps us continue on a good footing. So it's good all around. It's one of those categorical teachings, one that's applicable everywhere. So when you're dealing with decisions that are difficult, remember goodwill will help carry you through. You may not be able to solve the problem, but at least it gives you a good foundation. And as with all foundations, you don't want to leave it. Sometimes we think that a particular teaching is elementary and we're beyond it, but no. When a teaching is elementary, it's basic it means you've got to keep it right there as your foundation. And then everything else you do in the practice will be solid. <laughs>